During this joyful Eastertide, may the light of Christ scatter the fear and the darkness from our hearts and our minds, and may the Lord be praised for all his goodness, especially for bringing us together for this morning worship here in the parish church of St. Cuthbert, if you're worshipping with us for the first time. Good to have you here, and hopefully you can stay on for some uh, refreshments and fellowship immediately following on from this service. Also immediately following on from this service, for those who wish to attend the AGM, and this is just the presentation of the accounts, please don't go to coffee first. Stay in here for the AGM, uh, which won't take very long, uh, and then your coffee awaits uh, afterwards. All the intimations you can find as printed in the back of the order of service, and just a particular thanks to all those who are involved in a most uplifting Sunday service uh, on Easter Sunday just a week ago, and to thank the Soul Space, the Soul Space team, particularly Robert for leading a wonderful Soul Space reflection here in the sanctuary um, on last Wednesday, and also to note with great joy and celebration, it's the sixth anniversary of our partner charity, Steps to Hope, uh, this week. Um, they've been going now for six years, and they will be, as ever, here being served, serving our homeless guests a meal in the sanctuary uh, this evening. Those are all the intimations. With the eyes of our hearts enlightened, we see the immeasurable greatness of God's power. Let us worship God.
Steve. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let us pray. Worthy of praise from every mouth, of confession from every tongue, of worship from every creature is your glorious name. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God forever. You created the world in your grace, and by your compassion, you redeemed it. Heaven and earth are full of your praises. Glory be to you, O God most high. Angels and archangels and all the hosts of heaven worship you. We are not worthy to praise you, but for your mercy's sake. Accept the praises of all your servants in this house and throughout the world, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Gracious Father, your might is beyond measure, your wisdom beyond knowledge, your love beyond all telling. You have put eternity into our hearts and made us hunger and thirst for you. Satisfy the longings you have implanted that we may find you in life and find life in you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Merciful God, you made us in your image with a mind to know you, a heart to love you, and a will to serve you. But our knowledge is imperfect, our love inconstant, our obedience incomplete. Day by day we fail to grow in your likeness, yet you are slow to be angry with your children. For the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Saviour, do not hold our sins against us, but in your tender love forgive. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May the Almighty and merciful Lord grant you pardon and remission of all of your sins, time for amendment of life, and the grace and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And we say together the collect for this, the second Sunday of Easter, as printed on the order of service. Almighty and eternal God, the strength of those who believe and the hope of those who doubt, may we who have not seen have faith and receive the fullness of Christ's blessing through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. During these 40 days of the post-resurrection encounters, as they were after Christ's resurrection, he often comes into the presence of others and puts them at their ease by just saying, peace be with you. And we have an opportunity to do that ourselves here this morning as we share together both here and online with our online worshippers that same peace. So the peace of the Lord be with you. Let us share his peace. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you.
hear the word of God, firstly from the book of Acts, chapter 4, reading from verse 32. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Our epistle comes from 1 John chapter 1, reading from verse 1. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed and we have seen it and testify to it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be made complete. This is the message that we've heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Amen.
gospel reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, reading verses 19 to 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Amen. May God bless to us this reading from his word. Meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. That beautiful Easter Alleluia just sung by the choir in response to the gospel reminds us that we are still in this joyful Easter tide. But traditionally, this Sunday, the one after Easter, is known as Low Sunday. And that seems, I suppose, to take away any expectation that much is going to happen. It's a low Sunday, all the big moments in this story are now complete, and somehow we're left a little bit on a limb, wondering what happens next. And think of it, two Sundays ago, we were in here with all the euphoria of Palm Sunday, welcoming Christ, singing hosannas, and raising our palms. And last Sunday, we were in here collectively celebrating the resurrection. Both of these were majestic Sundays. We were riding on the wave of euphoria. Collectively, we felt good as we encountered the fact that Christ had defeated death on the cross. So what are the expectations now going forward? You could say that it doesn't really help to call this 
low Sunday. It sort of takes away any expectation that anything else is going to happen. But far from it, I think low Sunday is a very good way of looking at this Sunday because the euphoria of the last two Sundays has, as I said, have been quite collective. Together, congregationally, we have celebrated. The onus and the emphasis now becomes, you could say, more intimate. It becomes more individual as we have to work out the implications of what we have gone through in the last couple of weeks. And so rather beautifully, we turn to the story of Thomas, one that is well known to you. On the first slide that you have seen coming into church, and on this one now in black and white, we see this moment of doubting Thomas being depicted by the great draftsman, the German Albert Albrecht Dürer. And in many ways, when we see it in black and white, it doesn't seem to have, as it were, all the color, obviously, but I suppose all the sense of intimacy that we might come to expect in such a moment. And so what we do now is we turn to our second painting by Caravaggio. And Caravaggio does exactly, I think, what this Sunday is all about because he paints this moment of doubting Thomas being invited intimately to put his fingers into the side of God. And if you look carefully, Thomas is coming out of the darkness. And the closer that he gets to Christ, and particularly look at his fingers, he finds himself now in the light of Christ, that very light which we've talked about and heard in our first reading from Acts, being in the light of Christ. And likewise, our second reading, the epistle, talked physically about feeling our faith, a sense of certainty and a sense of knowing. Often people, I think, dismiss Thomas too readily. Who wants to be called a doubting Thomas? Well, I don't know. I'm very happy to be found in the doubting Thomas camp, because I think if we think we know it all, that we have a total handle on our faith, then we're not ready for the next surprise. If you think about Christ's earthly ministry, when he was born as a baby, which we celebrated not so long ago, no one expected to find him as a child. We were totally taken by surprise. People's faith were challenged. Many doubted that this could be the Messiah. And at the end of his earthly ministry in this post-resurrection time, people who thought they knew didn't know, because when they saw the risen Christ, they didn't recognize him. They had somehow to come to terms with the fact that he had changed. He had changed in all his glory so that he could be with us in a very different way indeed, perhaps to the Christ that we imagined. And so as doubting Thomas, he does the work for us. He asks the questions that are in our own hearts. And it's not just a one-off this occasion, this post-resurrection encounter with the risen Christ. He's been doing it for us all along. You might remember earlier in John's Gospel, it's Thomas who says, how do we know the way? How do we know how to follow you? And he rather beautifully gives the introit or the entry for Christ to answer that question, the question that burns in all of our hearts. How do we follow you? Because Thomas asked the question, how do we know? Christ replied, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Something that many of us hold on to now as we explore our faith. And so there he is again, having asked that question earlier in the gospel, that question of uncertainty, the question that we all want to ask, he does the work for us again. Unless I actually see you, I am not going to believe. 
I don't know about you, but last week on Tuesday night, I think it was, I was taking one of my daughters and her partner out for dinner. On Tuesday night, the mist, the fog had descended. It was a very dreek evening. And I was trying to convince her partner, Lewis, if you look up this street, Castle Street, you'll see the castle. So we looked up and there was nothing there at all. It was totally covered in the mist and the gloom. And he quite rightly said to me, you know, how do I know it's there? And I just said, you're going to have to trust me. I've been up there a few times. I know this city reasonably well. I promise you the castle is there. And rather beautifully, the next day he did see it in all his glory. But he had to believe me. He had to believe that it was there. And I think that's very much how our faith tends to operate, particularly in the doubting times when we're not certain of our faith, when the challenges around us are, are such that our faith is tested. We have to be like Thomas. Not only is it right to ask the difficult questions and maybe not necessarily have the answer that you were expecting, it's also right to say, until I see, I am not going to believe. If we look at that picture of doubting Thomas, of Thomas leaning in, look at how he leans into Christ. Look at how, through touching him, he finds a sense of certainty. And you know, there's very little difference between that picture and what we do when we come up to receive communion, because we partake of the body and blood of Christ through the bread and the wine. It's as if we are having a Thomas moment every time we come up and receive communion. It's a moment in which we get a sense of how close Christ is to us. But it's not necessarily a Christ that we expect to find, because the mystery of communion should never be taken for granted. It should always be that, a sacrament, a sacred encounter with the risen Christ. But as I said at the start of the sharing of the peace, Christ acknowledges the difficulty that our faith poses for us. He very beautifully says, after Thomas puts his hands into the side of Christ, Thomas, you believe because you have seen and you have touched me. Blessed are those who have not seen me or who have not yet touched me. And in many ways, that sense of I've not seen him, I've not touched him, is one in which the troubled minds of our faith need a sense of peace. And in all these post-resurrection encounters, and these are great, these 40 days, and we will be exploring them over the next couple of weeks, it's in these post-resurrection encounters that Christ encounters us in a very new way. He encounters us as the resurrected Christ, who we still may not fully believe in until we have seen or perhaps we have touched him. And so our faith needs to journey with us now more than ever. We have to believe that this is true. And by sharing with us the peace on all these encounters, peace be with you, it is through the peace, perhaps, that we find the presence of Christ, to whose name be all the glory and all the praise. Amen.
If you are able, please do stand as we declare our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, we give thanks for your goodness and love towards us, for the joy of home and family, for the companionship of friends and neighbors, for the activities that fulfill our lives, for the strength that supports us and the love that surrounds us both when our joy is complete and when it is touched with pain. God and love of power, we pray for your church in this parish and throughout the world, that through the courage and faith of your people, your word may be preached and lived. We pray for the king and those in authority that in the fulfilling of their duties, they may be guided by your spirit and upheld by your grace, Lord, in your mercy. We pray for our community, our country, and the nations of the world, that following the ways of truth and justice, they may be free from the bitterness and strife, and by the power of your love, live in peace. Particularly, we continue to hold 
all those in the Holy Land in our prayers. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for all who are in trouble, those who are, that those who are sick may be cared for, that those who are lonely, sustained, that those who are oppressed, strengthened, those who mourn, comforted, and that those who are close to death may know their risen Lord. And in a moment's silence, we bring before you those closest to our own hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for those who have died in the faith, especially those known to us, who have entered into the joy and peace of your nearer presence. Grant that we may follow their example and come to share with them the glory of everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with the Father and the Holy Spirit is worshipped and glorified forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is, is right to give our praise. thanks and praise. Blessed are you, Lord God, from the first of time to the last. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power, the glory, the splendor and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the sovereignty, and you are exalted over all as head. Wealth and honor come from you. You rule over all. And so of your own, now give, we now give you, for the good of your church and the glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray together, say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Now may the peace of Christ, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest and remain upon you this day and forevermore. Amen.